welcome to today's uh, webinar. This is a uh, U of I University of Illinois Extension and uh, Illinois Geothermal Coalition uh, collaboration that uh, we put this together with. Uh, my name is Jay Solomon. I'm a natural resource environment and energy educator with U of I Extension based up in the Northwest corner of the state. A little bit about this coalition. Uh, we pulled it together to look at how we can bring some of the resources on campus and make them more accessible to those of us out in the field and, and out across the state. Um, it's part of uh, some ongoing education that from the extension side, we've been doing for a number of years as the uh, energy team and the community and economic development team, bringing those resources out to consumers and policymakers uh, over the last say 15 or 20 years in particular. Uh, it's also part of a smart grid uh, ISEF grant that I've been involved with for a while, uh, brought us to this point. So today's particular webinar, whoops, sorry about that, is our part of our Geothermal Illinois Alliance or our resiliency series. So we move forward into it, uh, kind of a new series that we're working with covering topics on energy storage, disaster resilience, and sustainability. Well, so with that in mind, um, this is the first one we asked uh, a couple of presenters to come in, give us a good place to look at a group that's already looking at this uh, and, and give us some kind of benchmarks to work with and, and ideas to go forward. Um, so it'd be the federal models for, uh, let's say, title we use, federal models resiliency, but it's the federal energy and water sustainability requirements and the Army Energy and Water Resilience Policy. Our two presenters are Frank Holcomb, uh, Senior Researcher with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Engineering Research and Development Center, uh, Construction Engineering Research Laboratory. And Damaris Acevedo, uh, who is a research environmental engineer with the U.S. Corps of Engineers, Engineering Research and Development Center, Environmental Laboratory. So the two of them will be working through this and with this, uh, sharing a little bit of the work they've been doing. So with this, I will stop sharing and turn this over to Frank and Damaris. Okay, Jay. Okay, Jay. Okay, Jay. Okay, Jay. Okay, Jay. Okay, Jay. Comms check, 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 Jay. And no worries, we we can edit out that, but um, I believe you're unmuting your laptop instead of your phone line. And okay, so, comms check, Nancy. Perfect, yep. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, sorry for the audio. My name is Frank Holcomb, and I've got Ms. Damaris Acevedo with me. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jane. So what we'd like to talk about today are some of the federal energy and water sustainability requirements that we and the federal government adhere to. And in particular, we're going to go into the Army Energy and Water Resilience Policy. So the, the first thing we're going to do today is look at one of the websites that, uh, let's look at the outline. As far as sustainability in the federal government, we're gonna focus on energy and water. There's a number of other sustainability requirements that all of us in the federal government adhere to, but we're gonna focus on energy and water this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna show you some of the requirements and guidelines that we adhere to. 
And then we're going to switch over to the Army's Installation Energy and Water Program. And that's where Damaris is going to take over. She's our interim program manager for this particular program where we're helping Army installations here in the U.S. and across the world improve their energy and water resilience. So as part of that, we'll go through the benefits of that program, the drivers behind it, some of the goals, the critical missions that we'll get more into that with the regards to the Army installations, and some sample courses of action or projects that come out of these plans, again, to improve energy and water resilience. Then finally, some of the challenges for that program. The last part of this, what we thought would be interesting for the viewers is to show you some, again, high level examples of resiliency and looking at two particular cases for a residence, just a regular household, and also at a shelter and looking at what energy and water resiliency might look like, again, at a very high level and very simplistic view, but just to give you an idea of what some of those things might look like. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions. So the, the first aspect of this is really looking at federal sustainability requirements. And I'm not gonna read through all the bullets, but you can kind of see on the right, the federal government is the largest energy consumer in the nation. And one of the things, the websites that I like to go to is sustainability.gov. And I'm gonna transition over to that in a moment, but that's been kind of my go-to website for keeping track of the sustainability requirements. We've had a couple administration changes here in the last eight years and different executive orders come and go, different statutory requirements have stayed during those transitions between administrations and we'll kind of navigate a little bit through those. But the bottom line here is that for all of these sustainability requirements, they really relate to efficiency of federal operations and a way to save waste, uh, save, taxpayer, sex, save taxpayer dollars, and improve the mission and the capabilities of various components. So Demaris and I this, today are representing the Army and in, in fact, the Department of Defense, but the federal government is made up of a lot of different federal agencies and they all have different missions and different operations that they go through. So one of the, the metrics that we look at on the federal government side with regards to energy is energy's intensity. And that's really kind of a measure of the consumption of energy, but it's, it's really aggregated towards the type of facility that you're looking at. So in this, in this metric, the the BTUs or energy per square footage, that's the energy use intensity. That is a measure of how much energy a particular facility is using for its individual floor space. And there is a statutory requirement that this energy use intensity is reduced 30%. And that comes from the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. So you can see the horizontal line that is going across here. This is representing a 30% reduction from a 2003 baseline all the way across and out. And in the later years, really what it's asking for is once you've met that 30% requirement is that you demonstrate continued progress towards that goal. And that means that each year you should be reducing your energy usage correspondingly from the previous year. Okay, so this particular roll up in this slide we're showing you is the entire federal government. In a moment, I'm going to switch over to the website and show you how you can navigate to different federal federal agencies, including the Department of Defense. On this particular slide, this is demonstrating one of the other requirements, and that's for renewable electricity use. Again, this goes back to a statutory requirement that says that seven and a half percent of your facility energy, facility electricity use should come from renewable energy sources. And a number of the bars here are divided up into portions so that if you have renewable energy generation on site, you get a certain allotment for that. You actually get bonus or twice the amount that counts towards that requirement of that seven and a half percent. There are some other things here and I'll encourage you to look at the website in a moment, but all of these are across the federal agencies and there is a push towards more sustainable uses of energy and getting away from carbon and fossil fuel energy. 
So that's what this particular elect renewable electricity use requirement is for. The last item here is water use intensity. And again, this one actually goes back to an executive order. So some, there's some new guidance coming out, but this one states that 20% reduction versus a 2007 baseline year. And again, you'll see the same sort of thing, this horizontal line going across. It also has the same requirement to reduce that annually so that each year, the, the subsequent year should be lower than the previous year. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to switch over to the website and show you some specifics. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share the web browser that we have up. Okay, so this is at sustainability.gov and you can see some high level type of information here. What I'm going to do is they have different policy uh, site here. You can look at the different policies that we talked about and I'm going to show you progress, which is what I was showing you before. So if I scroll down, you can see that on the left-hand side, this is the overall federal government agency-wide and on the right hand side, you have the option through this drop down box to pick a particular federal agency. But Demaris and I both work for the Corps of Engineers, and that is singled out here because of the Corps' large civil works mission and military mission. But if we go down to Department of Defense and hit the go button, we can now look and see the corresponding energy use. So here's facility energy, water use, and renewable electricity. These are the three that I showed you before. You'll note that there are other sustainability drivers and requirements here that the graphs are showing the progress. So we can look at the facility energy use. Again, you'll see that the title has changed from the overall federal government to the Department of Defense. And each of these is going to change based on the particular federal agency that you pick based on their mission and their different requirements. And you can see again, the progress. I, I would note here that clicking on any particular year will give you some additional information. So this is that one energy metric, the BTUs per square foot or the energy use intensity. And if I go back, they have the renewable electricity use. And you can see here that the Department of Defense is actually doing quite well and has exceeded that seven and a half percent requirement for renewable electricity use. And then lastly, on the water side, here you can see that again, the DOD is below that cut line, this 20% reduction, and is doing quite well. So I'd encourage you to have a look here, and it's a very useful website. Again, you can look at policy progress, resources and guidance, and look at any particular agency that you may have an interest in that is in the federal government. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this and go back to the slides. Okay, hopefully we audio is still working. So uh, the next couple of slides here really talk about some of those requirements and guidelines. This is noting that in December of 2020, there was an Energy Act. There's still some implementation guidance coming out from that. There, I mentioned before the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Again, another statutory requirement that is has a lot of the energy and water federal requirements in that. There's the guiding principles for sustainable federal buildings. There's also some technical guidance on implementing stormwater runoff and so on and so forth. On the right hand side, it kind of shows you through acronyms, a number of these executive orders, different statutory requirements and NDAA's National Defense Authorization Act. So there's a lot of things that go into these and a lot of other requirements that we in the federal government have to abide by. So now at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Damaris Acevedo who's gonna tell you about the Army's Installation Energy and Water Program. Thank you. Hi, y'all. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm gonna be talking about the Installation Energy and Water Plant Program, uh, which we have been working on this for um, Army installations and the Army National Guard for three years now. Um, so basically, I guess the end goal 
is to improve uh, the resilience, the energy and water resilience and security at military installations. So with this plan, we provide a roadmap to delineate that. Um, so um, along with that, we look at the systems, the operations, the infra infrastructure to be able to, to accomplish missions uh, if there's an external or internal energy or water service disruption due to you know something plan or natural disasters and all that. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that and the goals of the program, which basically tie to this uh, overall purpose. Uh, so uh, like I said earlier, we've been working on this for a few years now. And we uh, work with the installation stakeholders, that is, you know, mission owners, tenant organizations, and others um, like utility providers uh, to be able to gather all the information we need um, to, to understand what is the current condition of the installations. Um, so with that being said, this is a data-driven approach. We collect a lot of data, we do a lot of data analysis to be able to understand what the condition of the installations is. Oh, okay, so basically there's a lot of plans that <laughs> the, the installations are required to work on. So with the installation energy and water plan, we're reducing the number of uh, planning requirements from seven to one, just to give you an idea about, you know, what it conveys here um, through this effort. I'm not going to go into details with that, just to provide you the big picture. And this kind of this has some of the information that Frank presented earlier about the requirements. So we consider a lot of those federal and sustainability requirements when we're working on the side webs. With that being said, for example, the energy use intensity, water use intensity uh, graphs that uh, Frank was presenting. So we consider that when we're working on the IWIPs to make sure that they are meeting those requirements. Uh, so anyways, we have uh, some guidance that um, that tells us, you know, provides you, provides us with information on what to do. So we use that as a basis for, for developing these plans and we have a standardized um, scope of work. So uh, a lot of what we do is based on the installation, um, uh, ISRMC installation status report mission capacity. They, the Army installations, most of them are required to submit that or, or we can just simulate that. But at a high level, we look at different you know, attributes that are tied to the ISRMC to quantify resilience. So as part of those goals, uh, we need to make sure that installations uh, sustain the necessary energy and water services for a minimum of 14 days for all critical missions when uh, the duration of the missions has not been stipulated. So 14 days is the minimum, but sometimes there's installations that decide to go uh, lower than the 14 days or higher than that. So uh, they define that, but as a minimum, we have the, the 14 day. And that is, you know, regardless of what happens at the installation, you need to continue running those missions with no interruption uh, for 14 days. So we need to ensure that they have both, you know, water and energy to be able to continue sustaining those. Um, we um, mitigate risk to critical missions from energy and water disruptions. Uh, when we talk about water, we all also include um, wastewater. According to, to a critical facilities list that has been approved by the senior commander. So we'll look at that. Uh, we reduce risk to future um, disruptions. <clears throat> by assuring access to water and energy resource supply. We ensure that we have uh, 
reliable energy and water, infrastructure condition, and effective system operations. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't have water. Mm. Mm. My um, throat is dry. Um, so anyways, and we also aim for reducing energy and water consumption through efficiency efforts. Um, and also we aim for increasing installation operational efficiency and lower uh, total operating costs. So this is what I'm gonna show you now is the process that we follow for the IWP. This is in a nutshell, of course, it, it takes more than what I'm describing here to do the, the full thing, but just for you to have an understanding of what we do. So um, initially we identify the requirements, we um, collect a lot of data that is related to the installations like water and energy consumption, um, uh, infrastructure condition type of information, master plans to understand what will be their future development. With that, we establish the baseline, which is the current condition at the installations and the future base case, which basically considers the master plans to, to basically look at what will the installation look like in the next uh, five years. So we look at the new developments and all that to see where they are going and consider that. Then we assess risk and opportunities with these two steps, we identify what are the deficiencies at the installation level. And we determine what areas need improvement, right? Um, so based on that, then we come up with, um, with solutions or courses of actions that will improve those deficiencies uh, in order to, uh, to improve basically their water and energy security and resiliency uh, posture. <clears throat> Based on realistic goals, um, the installation, and you know, basically what they can execute throughout the, the next five years, we come up with an implementation plan by right? considering funding streams and what they can execute every year. So we work with them on refining the implementation plan, which basically they select the, the solutions that they want to implement in the future to improve their condition. And then they execute and evaluate um, the plan. So um, here I'm showing a high level picture of all the IWIPs that have been developed in the United States. Um, this does not include, like we have worked on a portion of this IWIP, so this is the work that we have done and others. Uh, so there's been uh, around 55 uh, IWIPs developed for 45 garrisons. Some of them have sub installations and they're required to develop an IWIP as well. Uh, so for some garrisons, you may have more than, uh, than one IWIP um, if they have multiple sub installations. So this is for the United States. And then uh, Oconus, there's been uh, 16 IWIPs developed for 18 garrisons. And here is kind of the opposite where you have multiple sub installations probably rolled up into a single plan. Uh, due to you know funding limitations, um, so anyways, and and also because it makes sense to include all of them in the same one. Uh, so this is just you know the big picture of the work that the army has been doing uh, for this installation energy and water plans. So in terms of critical missions, um, if you look at the guidance, it'll tell you you know, the, the type of facilities that you can include it as critical. So we just included a snapshot in here 
of what we thought will be of interest for you. So you may have, you know, logistics type of buildings, uh, critical data sensor operations, uh, places that are used for strategic training, uh, field lift and port operations, um, critical manufacturing, uh, life, health, and safety operations like hospitals um, and, and things like that. So basically, when we look, we don't really look at the mi critical missions, we just look at facilities. So when you get that critical facilities list that is approved by the senior commander, you may have um, facilities that fall on the, under these categories. And I guess how this can be helpful for you or the community, maybe these are categories that you may want to consider in terms of you know, improving their, their resilience uh, at the places that you'll work at. <laughs> so um, I believe the guidance is available out there, right? And, and you can look at the full list uh, if you have interest in that, where they tell you, you know, what can be considered a critical facility. So, um, so I was talking earlier, oops, I'm moving too fast, about the installation status report mission capacity. So that is one of the pieces of information that we use um, for basically um you use, use it as a measure of resilience so basically uh we get a lot of information from that report that is related to critical mission sustainment assured access to energy and water infrastructure condition system operations so that report basically <clears throat> provides us with with the background information that we need to understand what is the baseline condition of, of a particular military installation. It's just a piece of information. We look at plans and, and other reports to basically support what is in, in this report, but it's um, a lot of the analysis that we do is based on this and the responses that the military installations have provided for this particular report. Uh, for the system operations, um, it has to do a lot with planning and whether or not you have people that are trained to to do the job or to you know make um, if anything fails let's say a water line breaks whether or not they can fix that so it has to deal with the planning and the people the rest are pretty obvious right um, so the ISRMC is based on color ratings and scores anything that is green or, or green cloth is acceptable. If it's less than green, that being amber, red, and black, it'll be sufficient. Um, there's a list of measures uh, for each of these attributes, and then um, you compute the, the attribute score and color rating based on those responses. So the end goal is to have each of these attributes in, in good standing to properly demonstrate resilience. So when we come up with, with COAs, um, we basically develop a lot of those based on what is deficient here. Uh, so let's say, for example, for water, then one of the measures tells you that the water system is not in good condition. Uh, and we found out that the the water pipes are old, right? So one of the COAs will be to replace the, the water pipes. Just something really simple for you to understand how it works. Um, here, we're just showing some examples of, uh, of uh, courses of action to improve resilience. Um, I'm gonna go over the water ones, and I'm not sure if you want to go over the energy ones. <laughs> I'm a water person. Frank is uh, energy. Um, so, anyways, for the water ones, uh, you may have water water efficiency retrofit projects. Uh, make sure that your water fixtures are efficient. Um, upgrade them. Uh, 
you may have water operational measures to look at, you know, whether or not you need more planning in place to be able to operate effectively, sure that you have on-site water storage, uh, redundant water supplies, uh, that is more than one water source. And then um, there's other alternatives here for for water sources, such, such as atmospheric water generation and alternative water capture and use. Uh, over to you, Frank. Yes, yeah, thanks, Carl. All good. Yeah, on the energy side, again, thinking back on that installation status report, mission capacity, those four areas, assured access is really talking about supply. And we always look at redundancy and diversity of supply. So the first bullet is talking about large scale central generation. I mean, the brute force approach in some cases is to put a small portable generator in every single facility of interest. But that again is kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. So you can look at things like microgrids, which is also listed here, where you're tying different generation sources together with some controls so that you can move power around to a number of buildings. And we're talking about military installations that are like small cities, like large university campuses that have a lot of different buildings, a lot of different facility types. Load monitoring and control, again, being able to shed loads or move energy around, automatic switching. Renewables is a big item here, again, going back to those sustainability requirements. And also the, the idea of getting off of fossil fuel or carbon-based sources. We've had some interesting experiences over in Europe. It's no secret, it's nothing classified. In the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, there is a prohibition on the purchase of foreign sources of natural gas. So a lot of our European installations, in order to meet that requirement, are looking at renewable energy and also looking at different heating sources that do not depend on natural gas, like we might have a natural gas furnace in your home. So with something like geothermal, again, getting back to the, the topic of the seminar, geothermal is a renewable energy resource, which is electrically driven. It uses the heat from the earth to give you higher efficiencies, but then you don't have to depend on external sources of fuel like natural gas or propane, which again could be such, such subject to price fluctuations or disruptions or things like that. So building scale uninterrupted power supplies. And again, as Damara said, this is kind of a snapshot to give you an idea of the types of projects and courses of action that we would recommend and as an outcome from one of the installation energy and water plants. All right, I forgot about this. Water <laughs> planning requirements. So from a water perspective, um, you, you need to support critical missions, right? that may include human consumption, sanitation, or all the buildings that are used for mechanical or industrial purposes. Um, so anyways, this just shows the, the big picture of the water distribution for different purposes and then how the water is collected into the wastewater system and discharge. And then when you look at water emergencies, you may have water quality outages or water quantity outages. Um, so here I'm just showing one of the resources we used uh, when basically calculating how much water is required for the critical facilities. Um, so this is just showing that particular research, um, resource from the Water Research Foundation and the U.S. Energy Information Administration, like basically you can use these values to make estimates for how much water you will need in the event of an emergency. These values are very conservative, right? There's a bare minimum of three gallons per, uh, per person per capita. So you could possibly, you know, use that calculation too. So if you use this, assume these values in here, the numbers are probably gonna be higher than if you use the three gallons per, per person requirement. Um, for the installations, we do it based on the use of the buildings and some research that was done 
um, for by one of our researchers where we look at the building type and how much water is typically used for that type of building. So in here, you can see that with time, we've uh, reduced the water use intensity significantly. Uh, so basically, when you look at the bars from 1999 versus 2016, we've come, you know, long ways with toilet use and um, washing machines and all that. Uh, so anyway, possibly you could use these numbers for making calculations and Frank is going to show some, some examples. So now talking about the IWP challenges. So And in, um, with Collabling, so we host workshops on sites to validate the information that we get, to discuss the courses of action. So uh, last fiscal year, we couldn't travel a lot uh, at all, and um, we, we were doing these workshops virtually, and it's very challenging to get the input that you need virtually. Um, Another big challenge is the ident identification of the critical facilities at an installation. Uh, you may have, I guess, different priorities when you look at the different tenants. Um, so anyways, it's always a challenge to get that final list from the installation. Um, I'm going to go here quickly. <laughs> We're good. Uh, there's uh, evolving guidance and templates uh, just because things change, right? The requirements change. Uh, so anyways, we, we have had challenges of that nature where we kind of like a movie target. We need to use this guidance then a new executive order came out and we have to apply what was disclosed in there. So that could be a challenge as well. And also classification concerns. Um, we had some issues this fiscal year. We tried to make our reports on classified or control on classified. We don't look at the missions. We avoid uh, looking at um, information that is secret to just because we don't want to classify the reports. A lot of the people in the BPW don't have the, the security clearances in place to deal with classified documents, so we prefer to leave it unclassified. Um, so we need to be really cautious with the information that is included in the report, so that could be a challenge sometimes. Um, and that's it in terms of the challenges. I'm going to turn it over to Frank now. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, thanks, Damaris. And again, just that was uh, the intent here was to give you a, a very high level view of some of the work that we're doing. And I think we've simplified it quite a mm -hmm. bit. It's, <laughs> it's very complicated. It takes us nine months or more to get these to the point where they start reviews and get to the final garrison commander approval. Uh, the other thing I'll mention too is that these are living documents. Once you've gone through one of these, you're basically starting over in the next year to implement projects, to see how you're doing, to evaluate just where you are. And there is no set of, of check marks or check boxes that once you've checked all the boxes, then you're good. It's like anything else as the technology uh, goes on and time goes on, there's always new challenges, there's new threats that are out there, new guidance and improving energy and water resilience is a, a continuous and almost a full-time job. So that said, this slide is, again, it is not a one size fits all, but it is, I think, a cartoon that is representative of a number of different things that Damaris has talked about. When you look at an army installation or a campus, again, this is just a representation. Some of our installations are quite large and have thousands of buildings on them. But here in the picture, you can see that you have multiple sources of electricity coming in. So that's one thing we like to see is dual non-located sources of energy coming in. You can see that there are renewable energy assets here with solar and wind. There's energy storage and large scale electric energy storage is coming along technology wise so that it's becoming more viable and more cost effective. You can see fuel farms because we'll 
ultimately still have generators that run on some sort of fuel and diesel fuel or what have you. There's a microgrid in here that's tying different sources of energy together. There is a water, there are water tanks for water storage on site. And we have geothermal here, again, taking advantage of using an electrically dr driven device powered by renewable energy to supply heat and cooling. So a lot of different aspects here in this picture. And that, again, there's no one size fits all. Everything's gonna look a little bit different in terms of mission and the types of facilities that we're supporting. So one of the things that we thought would be helpful for the viewers is to look at some examples. And again, these are kind of made up and we're, we're not showing anything army specific, but we thought we'd show something in a residential scale so that you can kind of get your arms around what some of these things look like. So we have a residential example and we also have a shelter that again, these are kind of made up, but just to illustrate the examples here. So here's an example and, and Damaris went through and talked about different calculations for water, okay? This one is based on three gallons per capita per day or three gallons per person per day. There's a list of assumptions here and it's a four person household. So for that 14 day requirement, it's showing what 14 days worth of water might look like in one gallon jugs. And the cost here is only on the commodity itself it doesn't include any storage or if you needed to have treatment for the water or anything else. Okay, so that's just one footprint here. If we look at now using a different metric where that three gallons per capita or three gallons per person per day is really a bare minimum, that's only drinking water, doesn't include sanitation or clothes washing or showers or anything else. But now if you look at different assumptions, where we switch to the 58.6 gallons per person per day and the four person household. Now we start to get into a little bit more volume, 3000 gallons. Again, the, the total cost for water is relatively inexpensive here in the US and other parts of the world it is not. But now you're looking at the storage capability and also the size that we're looking at. And again, this is for the 14 days minimum. Now let's look at energy. So here we're looking at a house that's, you know, 1,600 to 3,000 square foot, maybe 2,500 square foot average, a four person household, a two ton air conditioning unit, some different plug loads, including an electric water heater, an electric stove, a microwave, dishwasher, door opener, electric dryer, et cetera, some computers, what have you. Here's again, some just example numbers, about 27 kilowatts or 27,000 watts total, okay? And there's some different assumptions here. So the recommended generator, if you will, whether that is a solar panels that could supply part of this energy or a regular generator is 20 to 22 kilowatts. If we have a diesel generator here, then we're looking at a total energy requirement of 137,000 BTUs, and we're looking at 537 gallons of diesel fuel for 14 days. Again, that's something you would have to store on site. You'd have to make sure that you have treatment for the fuel so it doesn't go bad during that time or if it's long-term storage. But this is one example of the footprint here. So showing you a fuel cube or a fuel tank that would hold that amount of, of fuel this is 500 gallons in this case, and the cost for that. So again, very oversimplifying things, but just want to give you an idea of what something like this might look like. So now let's switch over from a residential application to something like an emergency shelter. And here again, some assumptions. Let's say we're taking a National Guard armory and repurposing it to make a winter homeless shelter for around 80 people. Okay. In this example, we're gonna use that higher water usage. So we've got toilet flushing, 14 gallons, shower, 11 gallons, faucet, 11 gallons, clothes washing, et cetera. So in this particular example, we're showing 46 gallons per person per day equates to almost 4,000 gallons for that 80 people for the 14 day minimum. And so there's the total 51,000 gallons. Uh, again, that's for the 14 days. It was 36 or 3,700 gallons for the 80 people. So what does that look like? And on this page here, we've got some larger scale water storage. 
again, this is something you'd have to look at uh, long-term storage and water treatment and other aspects, piping and plumbing, the energy to move that water to where it needs to go. We haven't really factored in all of those things here. Okay, here's another example. And here's some different assumptions providing different services. Uh, we're looking at the energy side here. So th this particular one is coming out to 50 kilowatts and five watts per square foot. So for that footprint, we're choosing a 150 kilowatt generator. And here it's a diesel generator. So here's the amount of fuel that you need for the 14 days. And again, what does that look like? Uh, here are some storage tanks and the total cost for that fuel for this minimum 14 days. So with that, that really concludes our presentation this afternoon. And I think we'd like to make some acknowledgements here as well. Some of our funding agencies are Headquarters Installation Management Command. We also work with the Assistant Secretary of the Army Installations Energy and Environment. They have an office of the Pentagon, the Deputy Chief of Staff, G9, also located at the Pentagon. We've worked with the National Guard Bureau in several states. And a special thanks to one of our PhD students, Ms. Luisa Feliciano, who was very helpful in putting these slides together. So with that, I think we'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank and Maris. And Folks, now is the now is your opportunity to ask the questions. You've got a couple of experts sitting there who've gone through some of this stuff. And the thing we all talked about with this was um, this is a chance to look at somebody's going through it in a very specific area, looking at, at the federal and, and military side of it. But what they're learning is very applicable when we think about this for trying to plan for either a home or a community. So I encourage you to think about it in that, in that framework of what are some of those questions and some of the, the ideas that you might have in a way of, way of resources and that kind of stuff. So appreciate them setting a very good standard for us to get this started. And that's the, that's the reason we chose to start here with this. So um, at this point, please type those in to the, to the chat box. Um, or um, and the other part of this while we're waiting um, I think we've got a couple of poll questions that we would kind of like to have everyone answer just to, as we look at it from the university side needing to uh, kind of uh, look at how we've done and how we keep moving this forward uh, I'll ask Nancy to go ahead and, and uh, fire those two off as individuals are, are thinking about this. So again, once you click on this, it'll, it'll go out of your screen, but appreciate your inputs into this. Give us some ideas of what, uh, what your takeaway was from this and uh, where we go with the rest of the series. And yeah, Jay, while, while that's going on, just something which may maybe foster some, some questions. Uh, one of the things, again, we glossed over this at a pretty high level. Some of the threats and hazards that we look at include natural threats. Obviously, there's different weather-related things, technological threats and hazards, which could include cybersecurity. And as we connect everything, the disruptions in that can cause everything from just headaches if your internet goes out to real problems if you have a secure system that needs to be operational that goes out. And also, just the, unfortunately, the man-made hazards as well, whether that is just human error or some intentional act that is meant to pull a particular energy or water system. So those are things that we look at for individual garrisons. We have a lot of tools that we use. Even climate change now is something that, as Mara said, as the guidance is evolving, uh, we're now expected to look at climate change. And the DOD takes a stance that it doesn't matter what is causing climate change, but climate change is and can affect emissions. So we have to do the, the actual planning for that. There's a question in the chat. Okay, would you like to? Yeah, there's a question in the chat box saying, uh, is the resilient 14-day uh, requirement for both domestic and international installations or just domestic? So this is applicable for 
all installations uh, that are part of the army, both in, in the US and uh, outside the United States. Sometimes um, they may want to do the 14 days, but uh, typically we use that 14 day standard. That's and again, time we, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, what, what we present is the requirement for the installations. You certainly can look the water. So every time we work on this, I go back and look at uh, what a big disaster we had in Puerto Rico, and it's like definitely we happens uh, to to be ready to continue operating um, at the installation level, continuing critical missions, and at the community community level as well, because you want to continue having you know hospitals running. Uh, some of those, you know, community services up and running, even if you have an emergency happening. Just in a nutshell, I talk a lot. <laughs> well, I think, yeah. Yeah. And I think you hit on it very, very nicely, because I would point out that I unfortunately kind of experienced that natural uh, human error type issue last night uh, in that for some reason we lost water pressure, completely lost water pressure in my neighborhood late at night. And I know that kind of uh, upset the, the balance around the whole area, knowing that even though we had water back on in an hour or so, but still kind of disrupts things. So, you know, it's something to think about. There is another question here from Andy. Uh, for each energy source, is there a specific annual reduction level or percentage that you're looking at? Uh, in other words, are you targeting some more than others? So the answer to that is not really. The way that some of these requirements look at are across the board. We do have goals and requirements to, again, reduce our fossil fuel energy use. Okay. Our comms check, we still good, Jane? You're still good. Okay, very good. So we do have these goals to reduce our fossil fuel energy use, which is really pushing us to more renewable energy, as well as nuclear. Nuclear is still on the table here. It's not a fossil fuel source of energy, but as far as specific loads, uh, not necessarily. We always look at a garrison, the complete garrison, as well as those facilities that support critical missions. So we try and lower the overall use by using conservation. That's probably the cheapest form of energy reduction is just plain old conservation and looking at at making more efficient facilities, seeing where we can reduce water consumption in different areas. And I think the Yufong had a follow on question to his previous one. The That's a very good question about the collaboration country or city requirement. And we have found many instances where we have all of the army garrisons and the federal government has to support national or federal sustainability requirements. But countries have country-specific goals and requirements. And even if we have a base at, at some country overseas, whether it's Germany or, or Europe or what have you, we have run into instances where the host nation has more stringent requirements, which we always try and strive towards as well. Even in the US here, different states have state requirements that have exceeded the federal requirements. So we see that as well. So that's a great question. And during our workshops and our stakeholder meetings, we always ask the particular garrison if they have any garrison specific requirements that they want to meet. Maybe they want to be carbon neutral by 2050 or they want to do, uh, we've had some recently that for the whole garrison, they want to have no downtime or no significant disruption in downtime, not only for the critical missions, but for the entire garrison. So we always take those into account.
again, a reminder here, and at this point, if, there, if you're having trouble with the, the chat thing and uh, you want to uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask the question of it, we'd, we'd love to have it written out. That way we can uh, look at it and, and provide some feedback later on and try to capture some of these questions to, uh, as, a, as a means of, of uh, concern, but or means of knowing what the interest was and looking where we go forward with it. But uh, I have a question. Hi, can you guys hear me? Sure. Yes. Hey, Frank. Uh, my name is Muhammad Elahi. I'm I'm with the Cook County Department of Planning and Development in Chicago. Uh, we recently started our program uh, for commercial property access clean energy. And I've been uh, preaching to anybody who wants to hear that um, geothermal obviously has been, a, 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 to me, uh, you know, if I had the power, obviously I would make everything geothermal, all the big facilities and all that. But the biggest impediment was to me was is the you know upfront cost, obviously. Now, given that the property access clean energy program can take care of 100% of that, uh, is it, um, safe to say that we can call on you, you know, given the expertise that you have every time we have either, um, you know, educational webinar with the contractors and all the large property owners and all that. So that's number one. And number two, uh, I've been getting a lot of pushback every time I'm in big meetings with the large facilities that want to move to a county. I get pushback from the, the the gas companies, they're always like, uh, they don't want, you know, for obviously, for obvious reason, don't want to promote uh, geothermal. So your comment on that would be appreciated. Thank you. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Mohammed, absolutely. I'm, I'm based in Champaign and Damaris is, she's based in Puerto Rico, but we're, we're working with virtual teams. We have a large group of people. I think part of our our mission as federal employees is really about education and educating the public on what we do. I, I feel that that's part of, of our responsibility as a federal employee. So happy to help, you know, it, just uh, let us know. I mean, based on schedule and what have you, happy to help. The, the one comment that I, I, was, I wanted to make, and I'm glad you brought this up with regards to geothermal, is that we're pretty technology agnostic, okay? So, we we have a responsibility as federal employees not to not to show favoritism towards a particular companies or non-government agencies but here's a case where geothermal is one of those technologies that can support our requirements and the the fact of the matter is that it can be life cycle cost effective we we actually see a lot more geothermal in europe at our garrisons over there than we do here but, but that's changing. I mean, we do have geothermal at our CONUS or continental US based sites. It is a little bit of maybe something to get past the first cost, but life cycle cost, it, it's always there. And that's one of the requirements that we have for our energy projects. With regards to natural gas, again, nothing against natural gas as a technology. I mean, we all, a lot of us have natural gas furnaces. We depend on it for heating and cooling but some of the mission requirements are now driving us to that. I mentioned one specific one in Europe where there is a prohibition on the purchase or acquisition of foreign sources of gas. And it's kind of hard when the, when the gas system is interconnected, it's hard to guarantee that a molecule of, of methane isn't coming from one of those countries that the legislation is targeting. So there's a movement to go to all electric facilities and I also noted that last week, Ithaca, New York, there was a headline, you can Google it. Ithaca as a city is looking at, at an all electric design for their facilities. So this, whether it's a, any, any trends that will keep going, you know, something that is gonna stay around for a while, but we are seeing that as looking at more electric designs. Again, some of these commodities like natural gas, propane and other, they're subject to price fluctuations. We've all read in the news that I think natural gas is going to be a minimum of 30% higher this winter. Okay. Now, if you have renewable sources of energy for your electricity, there's, unless climate change causes everything to cloud over, there's not going to be fluctuations in the cost of that solar energy because after you pay for the equipment, 
it's basically free you know, outside of maintenance and and what have you so those are the things that drive our mission requirements happy to help and just let us know thank you very much you hit the buttons right mohammed i would share the other thing and that is that that is the goal of both from extension and the uh the geothermal coalition to work towards providing the resources you were asking about so it's not just uh frank is available to you but Correct. the rest of us that are on the group here um and andy and and you find both represent part of that as, as amy uh and nancy and myself being involved with that so we appreciate you asking for that because that gives us what that that edge of why we keep moving forward with with the program yeah you guys are on my list as a matter of fact because uh, i actually went to uh, i have spoken and uh geothermal um geothermal geoia uh conferences and i know that you know university of illinois has been participant on it every time but you know to the surprise of all these contractors and engineers and all that i have given them the information on the financing side so they will be at ease that okay now they can go and really market it heavily because as long as the financing you know is taken care of then like i said if i had the power i will have each and every large facilities under geothermal we appreciate that support thank you um there's one more question a chat here <laughs> sure thank you for catching that yeah andrew is asking about which side is our favorite i can, i think i can make uh, a case for water <laughs> and uh frank can make a case for uh, for energy and you know thinking of reductions uh, when I think about favorite sites, I think more not about reductions, but about them being independent from external resources. They can get their own water right there at the installation without relying on utility providers or a private company. Um, you know, they're going to care about, um, you know, making sure that they have the redundancy on site and all that. Uh, to be uh, to be independent if anything happens. So a lot of instances, it's about them being able to have their own, you know, water resource. Uh, so I'm gonna look at it from that that perspective. Then if you look at it from the reduction perspective, I guess <laughs> if they pay a lot from external resources, they're gonna want to reduce reduce water consumption just to usage. Uh, cost will depend on usage. So a lot of instances, if they if they are paying for the water, they're gonna reduce uh, consumption just to reduce uh, cost. Um, I think a lot of the European ones are more advanced in terms of water, you know, consumption and all that, and, and having uh, more reliable infrastructures. I would say the European ones are probably my favorite ones because they're more advanced, I guess, to, to the requirements from the host nation. Yeah, that, that's a tough question, Andy. And, and, <laughs> and I think Demaris gave a great answer. A lot of it is just driven by cost. And we're certainly seeing these utility prices going up, especially on the water side. I know on the residential side, water has gone up quite a bit as a homeowner. But I, I don't know that I'll, I'll, the only thing I can really say here, Andy, is that every site we go to, we learn something. I mean, we've been doing this for a few years now. I think we're getting better at it for every for for every garrison that we do, we're getting a little bit better and we always learn something. We've worked with a lot of different stakeholders from garrisons that have missions for, you know, mobilizing troops or storing equipment or even the guard, you know, think about the National Guard and the type of mission that they have. They have disaster relief. They have different things that they do to help the state and the community. So they have a lot of different requirements that drive them. And a lot of the individual states have very progressive goals and requirements as well. So I, I don't think I can name a favorite, but all, all I can say <laughs> is that, you know, we, we really have learned quite a bit and it's, 
it's always refreshing, especially now we're even at a site uh, working remotely here at a site doing a workshop. And it's great to be back to traveling and seeing people in, in 3D versus 2D and working with the folks. And, and that there's very passionate people who work at these garrisons. So they really take their job very seriously and all of us are working towards the same thing. So it, it's been great. Appreciate that. I uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Thank you, Frank Damaris, for your presentations here. I think some of us will be around, but recognizing that we are a little past the uh, the three o'clock hour, which was we were looking at being an hour or just a shade over it. Uh, those of you who are on here and need to move on to something else, we understand. If you've got some questions that you would like to ask or still pressing out there, I think we'll be around here. But uh, from a, an official standpoint, I, I think I'll wrap this up at this point um, and, and just let this be a, a free-flowing conversation at this point uh, with some, I'll talk, try to moderate it, but leave it at that. Thank you very much.